Welcome to A Life in Film. If you enjoy this episode, please review and share this podcast. It makes a huge difference. We're also on Patreon, TikTok, Instagram, if you'd like to support us and get more content. An actor with an impressive credit list, including Kenneth Branagh's Murder on the Orient Express, which stars some of the biggest names in Hollywood, including Johnny Depp, Ron Howard's 13 Lives, based on the incredible true story, and he's even taken on Liam Neeson in Hans Peter Molin's Cold Pursuit. Other credits include Netflix's Behind the Eyes, Vanity Fair, Death on the Nile, and Goldie Horn and Amy Schumer comedy Snatched. Our guest today is actor Tom Bateman. Six part miniseries Funny Woman is on Sky now. Here's a clip. Are you telling me you actually want to act? <laughs> I was born in Blackpool and I came to London to be someone. I've always hoped to find someone like you. Comedy wise, obviously. I uh, will send you out on some auditions. Snow bikinis. Yeah. Ever. How are you? Nice to yeah, see you. Yeah, good. I'm not too um, bad. I'm not too bad. I'm trying to think, it's it was uh end of was it end of last year, funny girl. It yeah, what? December, <laughs> November, December, yeah. It's fucking cold. I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, it was not warm. In that room. It was not warm. Um, thank yeah, God for turtlenecks, you know? Thank <laughs> God for those, for those 60s turtlenecks. They kept us warm, didn't they? Yeah, how, how long were you shooting that? Are you, was it a couple of months or something? It was actually quite a long one, man. It was like, it spanned quite, because what was it, eight, six episodes, eight episodes? I think we started in like October, September, October, and then shot through like October, November, December. So like, I think it was like three and a half, four months, maybe. Um, oh, nice. it's so fun. It was such a fun. You were on for a day, two days, yeah, literally a day. So, I when I came on, I, I, I got like the feel of it. It was a really nice crew, cast, everything else. And by the time I got into it, I was gone. <laughs> so, yeah. That's always uh, the way they're the yeah. worst. Do you know what? It's funny, man. I remember like first like couple jobs and stuff, and like you, it, it's hard, it's, it's harder with those small parts when you get like one line. One of my first telly jobs was in Spooks, and I had like for like, like a line you know and it's stressful as fuck and all the other guys that are, you know in the scene with you um they're all kind of chilled and relaxed because they've got loads and they've been going to be like this is my one day my one line i need to nail it and it's really important to you but you realize you're the tiniest little cog and stuff but that's uh, the problem though like i think yeah I've, I've definitely talked about this before with other people on here like the pressure of like you think, oh, if you're a lead in a film, that's going to be major pressure. Everything's on your shoulders. But actually, I've found in my experience that coming in and doing that one day or the two days, because you've only got that little bit and you're like, well, if I screw these little bits up, that's there's way more pressure on it. And, and also no one is there to help you when you're like a bigger part. It's like everyone's like, you know, coming yeah. together to sort of give you anything you need to sort of pull through. Yeah. But yeah. Um, also, it's, I find as well, it's the, you know, it's I still we all I think suffer from imposter syndrome and um, the feeling that you don't know anyone when you turn up on a set and you don't know anyone the first few days are the hardest um, I remember an actor Michael Elwin saying to me once one of my first telly jobs he said um, he said the first day you never forget how scary it is he goes doesn't matter how old he's a lot older he said doesn't matter how long you've been doing it he goes that first day is terrifying because you don't know any of the crew yet you don't really know what you're doing you haven't got a uh, sort of back and forth yet with the director and the other actors and stuff and so for stuff that I've done coming in for a day and stuff is horrible because you can't get that and once mm -hmm. you've got that you start to be creative and play and um but did you enjoy it because I thought that was one of the that that job for me was one of the funnest Asha Ali one of the leads in it who I don't know if you met he um he described it brilliantly he described it as a as a warm pullover as a, of a tv show he said it's mm. just warm and snug and cozy to to read to watch and to film and um did you enjoy it i really enjoyed it yeah i am um, a little bit stressed out because all my well you, you will remember probably because i was like can we go through the lines because like all my yeah. lines had changed the yeah. night before and i was like oh my god so your so scene like, was stressed. like in front of loads of fucking extras as well the, the background and stuff and it's tough yeah. because you, you you didn't get to do you know what I mean? It's like it's not like you just had like one scene where you sort of come in and it's a small environment. There was loads of crowd yeah. coming on and 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 people sort of moving around. It was like a moving feast of a of a of a, of a scene. You know, I thought you did it was great. A, I mean, it was a nice it was a nice thing to come into because it's unusual to have 
you know, be a small cog and a big thing. But then the whole set was about my character, obviously being the photographer. Mm. So it was like that weird combination of like, oh, okay, so now suddenly I'm in meant to be in my element. This is my home, yeah. and this is you know how I deal with things. And so it was kind of a bit like a bit mad, but I mean, yeah. it was a it was a great little part because it's you know yeah. it's essentially David Bailey. I know they've changed the name, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it was good fun. It yeah. was good. Fun. You did you did wicked. You did really well, and um and I and I think there was quite because I mean it was such a it was one of those series, one of those dramas where that's what it was. I think it was fucking hundreds of characters, so many characters, mm -hmm. um and all so rich and important. Um, but a lot of them were people coming in for like a day and then going off and, and maybe coming back for another day. And um, like my friend Alistair Petri, he came in. Um, I think he oh, shot of course he's stuff. in it as well, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, and I've known him for years. We did a play together, and um, and he said, "How weird do we get?" He loved it, but he said, "Fuck!" He said, "I come in." He goes, "And you're all vibing because we've been going for a few months, and suddenly <laughs> he has to come in." And his character, had, you know, he he sort of knows all of us, but he didn't really know anyone, and suddenly we're thrown into the deep end. And but he really enjoyed it as well. But he he was saying, "Fuck, man, I'm just shooting all." I think he was done in about ten days or something. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. yeah, it was great. The um, I mean, seeing the cast now, because obviously I didn't really know who was going to be in it other than yourself and Gemma and the kind of, you know, the leads. But then actually seeing the ensemble cast as well, I was like, wow, this is like they've really yeah. pulled out a brilliant cast. Yeah, um, it, was, it was really cool. It was a real like like David Felfour and all of them. It was a really and, and I was really lucky because my character obviously shacks up with Gemma's. I got to meet because I was talking to Matt and Leo and Asha, who, who I did most of my stuff with. And they didn't really leave that room, the writing room. Um, whereas, because me and Gemma obviously have our little whirlwind romance, I got to meet all the characters because I'm I'm shacking up with this sort of lead character. So it was it was really fun. I felt very uh, blessed to be able to meet most of the people that, that mm. came in, even if it was just for an afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Have Have you seen any of it yet? I've seen a bit of the uh, ADR. I've done a bit of ADR on it. Looks really funny. Um, and we've got a little WhatsApp group me and the guys um and and they've seen it all and stuff and we just i mean we just spent we just spent three four months trying to make each other laugh um which could either be brilliant or <laughs> you know because we had a good time but obviously what you find funny and what other people don't but um you can only be true to yourself can't you and uh, uh you could really uh, tell it had a great vibe everyone seemed to be like really relaxed and oliver parker the director he was um just like someone like that, who's obviously very experienced, he's been working in the industry for years, he's done lots of great films. For someone like that to be so kind of personable and just relaxed and friendly and easy to talk to, I just thought the whole the whole vibe yeah. seemed really nice. So I'm, I'm really looking a, forward to seeing it. A, um, I, I'm so lucky I've worked with a lot of directors who started out as actors. I think that's probably the way a lot of directors go. Um, and he was one of them. And they're just amazing for actors, because even if you're coming in for a day, he, he's been that guy. Do you know what I mean? He's been you how many, like 20, 30 years ago, he was you coming in being like, I've got one day, I'm going to come in and shit, I don't know who anyone is. So he's really good at noticing that coming up, being like, hey, what's up? Chilling you out a bit. And mm -hmm. yeah, I love that man. He's great. <laughs> well no like, I mean that that I'm looking forward to it it's October I think that it comes out isn't it yeah October I so. yeah I think so yeah but um I mean obviously that's uh, that's where you are now but I want to like this whole you know this whole podcast is about how you got to this point um and I'm intrigued to hear obviously you went to drama school and everything else but what was like before drama school when you were a kid was there like a kind of moment that you realized that like, I want to try you know being an actor there were, in not so many ways, I think, yeah, it's easy, I think, to look back and, and go, oh, yeah, there are these moments. Um, at the time, they don't feel like it, uh, I guess. Mm -hmm. I've always, um, I've been very lucky in my family, my parents, um, I didn't have any money growing up. We had no money growing up, my family. And uh, But what was really lucky was they they just said, look, just do what makes you happy, in a way. If you find something that, like, a passion that makes you happy. And, and I did everything, like everyone does at school. And plays was one of them. Like, we all had to do drama. Um, but I remember feeling a big thing really, I think was the national youth theater. I, I don't know if you did that. I did, I went off and did that. A bunch of people in my year at school would audition for it. And our drama teacher, uh, Mr. Slater, he, he was, he was like, oh yeah, you should, you should go for this thing. And I got a place at the national youth theater. And that's where I met people who were considering doing it like professionally. I didn't even know you could really do this as a job. I didn't even consider it. Um, and I think that was where I sort of went oh my god this is kind of amazing and I remember I got asked to after my course I got asked to do a play with them in the summer holidays 
And I loved it so much. And I made such good friends. And I'd never done a play like that, like in a proper big theater with like, um, I'd only ever done amateur dramatics and school plays, right? And the difference between, and suddenly I realized going on to do that play, that the public will come in and to see a play. I'd never had that experience before. And I was terrified. And I guess they call it the drug, right? Uh, and I remember coming back to school thinking, fuck, I'm not interested in anything else really. And my mom and dad were really sweet and supportive. And they said, look, uh, you, you're doing well at school. You can't go off and be an actor now. So get your head down, get your school grades. And then if you want to be an actor, go off and do it. Um, and I did that. But um, yeah, I don't think there was a particular moment. My mum tells this story when I was in primary school and I got the part of the star that Mary and Joseph follow to the manger in the Christmassy thing. And apparently I was really, really sick the day of it. And I have one song is like, follow me or whatever. And apparently I was green and I was throwing up and they were all saying, well, look, everyone knows this song and stuff. It's okay, Tom, because uh, everyone knows this song because they all join in with it. But, and apparently I said, no, I'm doing it. And um, which makes me sound like an asshole. <laughs> but also um, uh, mum said at that point, you went, she went, ah, he likes doing this stuff. Uh, he's not aware of it yet. Cause I think I was about five um tenacious little prick of a five-year-old but um I think at that age she's my mum sort of tells that as a thing of like oh yeah I noticed then that maybe you, you know you're not one of those kids who who, who doesn't want to get up and and have a go you know yeah that's funny isn't it because obviously at that age you're kind of I guess not really aware of what you want to be doing when you're you know an adult but um I love that your mum clocked it and was like wait a minute yeah, yeah. <laughs> was it yeah, and she actually, she was beautiful when, I mean, I've, I've, I've been so, so lucky and how supportive uh, everyone in my life has been of, of this crazy decision to enter this industry. But I remember when I was 15 and I said, to her, I think I want to be an actor now. I, you know, I like the look of that. I remember she said to me, you're so lucky that you found what you want to do, because whether you're successful or not, at least you know that you found something in this world that you love. And so many people don't, I think, and, and they're, they're people I, I really feel for if you, if you don't find uh, what you love, because even if you have great success and, and fortune um, in, in whatever field you choose, if you don't love what you do, it's always going to be work. But I think the blessing, and my mom and dad could both see that, of just, he loves doing this so much, it makes him so happy that whatever comes and they knew it was one of those industries that is really tough and it is really tough or always I don't think it ever gets easier you just get used to how tough it is um but the joys they're they're aware they're like you're gonna have the most fun uh, random strange life and I have you know mm -mm. I I don't know whether or not um well we can because I can edit around everything we say but I do remember you saying to me and it it made me really think about it was um when we were leaving for the day to get the train and you said that you know because obviously we're talking about the pandemic and like it's it's been hard obviously waiting for jobs and seeing what's coming through and I remember you said to me you were like oh um you know that there was a gap in work and then something came through that I wasn't sure about and I, I didn't know whether or not to take it and you were discussing it with your agent and um and then you said that you know we held out and we waited and then the Ron Howard movie came along 13 lives yeah just to talk about the power of no and like and, and kind of making decisions like that where you actually you do have more power than you think sometimes but when you told me that story it really struck me I was like you just don't know as an actor and one of the beautiful things is you what's coming around the corner it yeah. could change any day 100%. yeah 100 percent. And, and 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 well weirdly enough funny woman the the job we met on um that was, I remember having a bit of a sort of like, I think I'd, I'd missed out on a job I really wanted. I'd been offered one I didn't. And it was this sort of confusing time. And there'd been about two weeks where I had like nothing. And I remember walking back to my car from the pub. I'd only had one. And uh, <laughs> my phone went and it was my agent. And he just said, oh, mate, we just, um, we just had a, an offer through for you for this, <clears throat> for this thing. Um, have a little look. But we think it's really fun. We think you'd have a great time doing it. Um, and I remember thinking, getting in the car, going and having a little look at it in the car and just went, oh, that's the next four months. But do you know what I mean? Like an hour before that, you have, I have no idea what I'm doing for the next four months. So there is, yeah, there is that joy. I think with the, the no thing, I've, and I'm still trying to learn it myself, um, but I, you know, I've been told by many people, the only power you have is to say no as an actor. I'm not sure that's entirely true, um, but it is a, 
it is a bit of authority we get because we are, I think, the very difficult thing of, of any self-employed artist, whatever it is you're doing. Um, you you are waiting for that, for someone to give you a job man, and like a, and an opportunity. And, and we all, I don't think anyone would, would become an actor who didn't believe in themselves at some level, whether it's big or small belief in yourself. You must have something in you that believes that you can do this very scary, crazy um, ruleless thing, you know, um, and so to sort of keep hold of that belief <clears throat> is really difficult. So if you're waiting for um, the yeses and they don't come, when a yes comes, almost no matter what it is, you want to say yes to that job. Um, and I think at the beginning part of your career, I, I certainly had it. I did say yes to everything. It didn't matter what it was. It was small, big, ugly crap. You know, it doesn't matter. You're like, I just need to work, earn my, learn my craft um and just try and sort of get experience um through doing it and then if you're if you're fortunate enough um you get to a position where you start being able to think wait I wasn't ah, that job I did I wasn't sure about it and, and it didn't make me happy um the end product um I wasn't proud of it and and everything and then and then you go and this is a similar issue which is I think what um when we were talking was was that I was being offered something that was I didn't really like my agents didn't like it but it was a job and it was after the pan, it was the first job to come through really since the pandemic. And I remember saying to my agent on the phone, well, listen, I haven't worked in like a year. Like, would you, you know, even if it's rubbish, I, I want to do this. And they were the ones that said, look, hold out. Let's say no, because we really think something good could be coming. And it did. But it's it, that was a very lucky um, moment. I, I have had moments where I've said no to a job and then the job whatever it was had finished and I still haven't booked anything and you go fuck I should have just done it sure. but at the same time you've got a the only thing you've got is 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 your own gut and your own instinct and um and that and I think it does I think it does come good and and really if you look at for me it's looking at the people I admire and the careers that I wish to follow in the footsteps of um or do my version of that um, and of course, no one's had a had a perfect glistening career where they haven't had any duds. But at the same time, you think, I'm not sure about this job. Look at the people you admire. They don't do work like that. And, and if you start going down one road, what tends to happen is people go, oh, you're that guy who does that thing. Do you want to come do that thing again? You go, oh, I never wanted to do that thing. And now that's the only thing I got asked to do. And and then another part of you. Sorry, I'm rambling because it's really I'm still, as you can tell. Oh, still, yeah, no, yeah, I'm with you. Like, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, you then also think. I'm so fortunate to even get any work. Um, still, every time you get a job offer, you're like, holy shit, really? I get to do this? That's mad. I lie awake and think, fuck me, I'm so lucky. I get to go and do this thing. And how many people would kill for this? And um, So saying no is really scary because a, an offer comes through and you think, yeah, but I'm just lucky to be working, aren't I? And you think, yeah, but you've also got to try and um, build, I guess, some form of, I don't know, uh, just a body of work that you're proud of, I think, because at the end of the day, mm. one has to wake up, brush your teeth in the mirror and look yourself in the face. <laughs> it's, the, it's the solid stepping stones, isn't it? And I guess if there's one that's not quite as solid as the others, and you, as you say, you, you can end up doing things you don't want to do, and then that's literally it. You've got no other choice. It's, it is a really, it is a very hard thing. And um, you mentioned there briefly that there are you know people that you admire in the industry and, and and careers that you would like to emulate um who would you can you touch on who those people are oh yeah man i got loads and and i got so many <laughs> like um uh uh vigo mortison i'm saying people i've got to people i've met so they're in my consciousness mm. vigo i mean god damn that guy's amazing and and every um everything he does he, mm. he he's just beautiful in and he just keeps people guessing he doesn't you know he's not he hasn't been boxed in anywhere he's uh, he's one of those guys that um because i watched i watched your movie 13 lives i thought mm. it was absolutely brilliant i mean you expect nothing less from you know ron howard and from the people yeah. in that movie but vigo mortison is one of those people that in that film if you if someone doesn't point out that's vigo mortison you're just going i know man who's that Who's that guy? Who's that British guy? Because yeah, he he's just he disappears into the yeah, character. Man. It's crazy. And he does that. He, he's like that as a person. He's so um, you walk into a room and you don't notice he's there. Do you know what I mean? He's not the kind of guy that that. I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Because that's talking about something like star power. Like you know, someone walks in and you're aware they're in the room. But he goes just amazing. He's like this assassin. He sort of just comes in and you don't even notice he's there. And you go, fuck, man, he goes there and he's just. <laughs> 
but he's yeah he's amazing and i and and i think what's the most amazing about him is he just doesn't give a shit about anything other than the work like he doesn't care about any of the stuff surrounding films um he doesn't care the only thing he's focused on is the work and um when you truly meet someone like that it's incredibly powerful um and infectious because you think shit i want to be look at that guy's focus look at his passion and his and and his drive and he's not him by accident he is him because he is an artist who is constantly trying to push himself and learn and, and get better um so there's him but people i mean i remember one of the first actors that i thought holy holy shit uh that person is just limitless in what they can do um was the late Philip Seymour Hoffman. Um, oh, wow, yeah. I, I just, I, I loved, I, I would go and watch something just because he's in it. I don't care what it is. And um, I think for me, it's, it's, the, it's the people who, it's the, it's the actors that continually, um, I guess, redefine themselves or, or, or challenge themselves. You see that they're putting themselves out of their comfort zone and it's a really hard thing to do. Um, but when you see it like Brendan Fraser, I can't wait to see this new movie that he's done. Yeah, The Whale. Completely, and you just think, and, and and seeing how much it means to the guy. I've just been seeing, reading these things about him breaking down in tears at, at, at the reception that he's that he's getting, and you think, fuck, that's just so exciting. And mm. uh, it's difficult to look at people and go, I want that career, because in a way, careers don't exist really, do they? They're just like they're just like random blobs that 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 we can look at from a certain perspective and and stitch together and go, that's their career. Like Brendan Fraser is fascinating to look at. Mm. Two years ago, if you'd have said that he'd be at Cannes getting the standing ovation, everyone would be like, what the hell are you talking about? That's not his career, his trajectory. That's what's wonderful about this job, that you can continually reinvent yourself. It's never too late. It's never, mm. um, as long as you're willing and and someone else is willing to to take that leap of faith with you, um, uh, anything's really possible. And and I think that's what like what I really, truly want, really, from a from a career, is is a career that is allowed to take risks and do different stuff. Um, that's what gets me excited. So they're the people I admire when I see them. It's not necessarily the actor, I think. It's more their 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 ability and um, that they've been allowed to get creative and experiment. Mm -mm. Well, when you talk about people like Philip Seymour Hoffman or Viggo Mortensen, they are people that you regime would have said no quite a few times <laughs> to various things obviously at a stage where you know they, they can do that but those sort of actors as you say are just exciting because you never know what they're going to do next mm. and um with brendan fraser it is that thing of like i can't wait to see it because it's it's you know you think of the mummy or you yeah. think of like you know the films he did in the 90s <laughs> yeah. yeah um and to see him in that like i think they must have put him in a fat suit and everything else but he just looks unrecognizable oh, um yeah i'm re i'm really looking forward to that there's there's been quite a few um movies from the uh, venice film festival that look look, look pretty fun. cool but so do you know the re the really exciting thing i think is when actors constantly i repeat myself here as i do which is the great thing about you being able to cut some shit out um <laughs> Is the is the people who redefine? So either I'm obsessed at the moment with Nicolas Cage. Oh yeah. Saw, did you see Pig? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Oh, no, where the hell did that come from? And then and then watch the unbearable weight of massive talent. And I'm like, that's even bonkers that you would say yes to like. Surely that's a concept. Some come to you as a concept of a film. That's one. That's one you say no to. But he said yes to it, and he fucking made it work. And I and I loved it. I think I cried in it. And um, <laughs> and it was exciting because you just go, man. If you, it, it's when the thing that scares me about a career is is the getting narrowed into a little. Yeah. Uh, into a little niche where people go that's you that's what you do that's your thing stay in your lane that's what really scares me um whereas and, and that's why i get excited when you get to see like what's happening to brendan fraser or or, or like nicholas cage is doing pig i'm gonna turn a pig on going is that nicholas fucking cage what's he doing in a movie that looks like it costs a million dollars to make do you know what i mean and they're yeah being amazing and yeah he he really like because he he's taken some he's made some weird choices but like recently he's been doing these films where you've just gone Ah, oh, this could have gone either way. Like this could have yeah. really gone yeah. either way, and including the um unbearable. What's it called? Unbearable. Unbearable weight of massive talent. Yeah, massive talent. Yeah, I mean that does. on paper. Yeah, I know. But also with Nicolas Cage's stuff, it does. Like his jujitsu movie. 
Like what? If you I seen, haven't like, seen that, oh, it's mad, man. It's mad. Um, but he's there and he's in it and he's doing it. And you go, that's fucking batshit crazy that you do that. And then you'll go off and do some art house thing. The guy is fucking talented and just, mm. and just, um, uh, I guess like a maverick. And you just go, you are just, you're, you're your own fucking entity there. And, um, well, he and, literally uh, is, isn't he? Like he is Nicholas, he's just Nicholas Cage. He's not even an actor. He is Nicholas Cage. Nicholas and he, he's, um, have you heard about the there's been rumblings about them doing another face off because of him oh, almost up. reinventing himself and then you then you think of you think of John Travolta the oh. man that's had more comebacks than yeah. Rocky like he's yeah. he keeps getting back up yeah um, that would be if they could pull it off oh my it's god it's very 90s isn't it that film but i love that movie man oh that's if they could do it with those movie. two in it now it would be amazing that would be Fuck one of the sequels i would actually i'd be like bang up yeah <laughs> you know what they're amazing right movies like that i fucking love them so much because they were 90s pure like cheese and romance but what i love about it is People loved move. They loved making movies. They took it seriously, but they laughed at themselves at the same time. And mm. what's incredible about that movie is it's not just the two of them. Everyone in it is so bold and so good. Like those actors are sick. And and you look at what Travolta and and Nick Cage doing that. It's fucking bonkers. And imagine someone pitching you and me this idea for a film where you rip someone's face off and go undercover as them and. Uh, you know, you mental. mental. You meant that's in a mental concept, but it's still one of the films that I would always, if it's on, I'm like, that's what I'm doing. I'm watching Face Off. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? How I, I think the 80s and 90s for movies, for me personally, maybe because I, you know, I was born in the 80s, so that is kind of my era as a kid. The 90s were like all those action movies and stuff. I just thought the lack of CGI and the kind of they were just felt a bit more simple and just fun. I mean, yeah. there were a lot of bad movies as well. Yeah. But when a movie was bad, it was almost enjoyably bad. Totally, um, totally. Because they weren't, vibe. yeah, and they weren't trying to do anything other than you've paid your money, you're here in the cinema, we're going to entertain the shit out of you. Mm. And you might get moved, you might, and of course, you know, there were also movies going around at that time that were very moving and 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 and, and beautiful. And uh, But then you can't beat The Rock, man. Like, it's just, come on. Like, <laughs> Come on, that's so good. So, actually, talking about that, what would uh, what is what are your kind of favorite movies? Like, what what is a, a like face off something that if it's on TV, you're like, I'm gonna sit down and watch this. Something that you you watch and you go, ah, oh, one day I'd love to be in a movie like this. Yeah, man, it's such a good question, and it it's a, it's a really hard one. I mean, one of the films that I remember watching, thinking, oh my god, I would love to be in that. Um, and I was a kid when it came out was Gladiator um, and that is one that if it's ever on mm. I will watch I think that I do the the spectacle the performances this it's just stunning so things like you know movies like that but um, the the sort of the more I like sort of studied film like I became obsessed with um, Paul Thomas Anderson is is someone I'd cut off my ear to work with men like I I just think he's a he's an incredible artist he he, he hasn't done a film that I haven't totally been in love with he's brilliant um, yeah he is and he and he's just so stunningly beautiful and again it's like a real artist um doing his thing but he's got such humor um he's he's someone that I think I would I would die die to work with um have you got a favorite of his movies Oh man, that's so hard. I think one of my favorite movies of all time is The Master. Um, mm. I just think it's so I incredible um, as a film. And and two of my favorite, at Joaquin Phoenix and um, Philip Seymour Hoffman and Jesse Plemons, who I love. Um, they're all in there just being amazing. Um, there will be blood. I mean, Jesus. I don't oh, think- Oh, that film is, yeah. It's possible to, to, to sort of say, uh, yeah he's just I'd almost be scared to be in a movie of his because I hate watching myself so much that it means I wouldn't get to enjoy do you know what I mean yeah. uh, it's one of those like uh yeah it, working it, with um you know working with someone of that level as well someone that especially if you've grown up watching their movies it must be and I'm, I'm gonna obviously talk about Ron Howard here but like being on set and just seeing Ron Howard on set and and being there like well I've you know I'm going to go over there and do my lines with Vigo Mortensen in a minute like yeah. what is that pressure like on the first day mad i mean i mean um 
mad in that it's not uh it sort of felt it sort of felt normal. I think that we had it was such a strange experience because we had to quarantine and we had all these Zoom rehearsals. We actually got to meet each other. Ron's very particular as well. He wants to meet everyone. Um, so I'd 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 read for him and then he wanted to Zoom with me at like 4 a.m. UK time because he was in Australia. And I remember barely sleeping because I was like, oh my God, I haven't got the job yet, but I think he likes me because he wants to talk to me. And, um, <clears throat> but he spent like an hour just talking. So by the time I got on set, I kind of felt like I knew him anyway, but mm. it still is, yeah, there's that, you, you do look at him and go, oh my God. But I'll go back to the thing I said about Vigo. Um, and so being on set with like the both of them, also Colin Farrell and Joel Edgerton, fuck me, they're just amazing um, actors. I mean, when, when I got cast and I literally looked at the cast list and was like, these are my favorite actors. <laughs> yeah. um, but, and, but what's amazing about them is they are all wanting to just, they don't give a fuck about anything. They just want to get in, have a really good time, but work. They just wanted to work and work and work. And um, it becomes so infectious that you would just get obsessed with the minute details of what we were doing. I found myself just really, it sounds cliched and cheesy but just learning so much and just soaking it up and just being around guys all day every day we're in this fucking tank and you just watch Ron work um you and he it but it never looks like work with these guys it just looks like serious play it, it, it looks like they're just creating the most amazing things they can they're kind to each other it was never anyone shouted at it was mad everyone was just fun um <clears throat> You think I'd sort of work? It would have worked out a more succinct, um, articulate answer. It's clear that I'm just sort of in awe of these guys. Yeah, no, I think it comes across that exactly what the experience yeah. was like. Yeah, but at the same time, you don't. There's almost no uh, pressure to it. Like I remember, Ron, Ron did this amazing thing. It was so in the in the movie towards the end. Um, I've got this scene where Chris breaks down. Jewel, who I was playing, he breaks down crying and. Um, uh, Ron was amazing because we had like 400 extras. It was about three in the morning. There's like rain machines. It was too cold and shit. We were really tired. And it was like these last few scenes. And Ron came up to me and he asked me if I wanted to do a close up or a wide first of my scene where I break down. I remember thinking, this is fucking mad. Like he's Ron Howard and there, this is a stressful day, but still he is excited. He runs up to me through the rain machine, got an AD running behind him trying to keep this umbrella over his head. He's like, don't, don't, don't. Do you, how do you want to do this next scene? I'm like, what do you mean? How do I want to do it? Like you're on fucking Howard, like do it the way you want to do it. That's how I want to do it. Um, but he, you know, he asked me what, and it, he just cares about who the person is. Um, how can I get the best work out of them? Um, they're just beautiful, amazing people. And, and, and I've been so lucky to, to work with a lot of people that I've admired. And the one thing they all have in common is there's no coincidence that they are who they are you know there's no luck i didn't ever i haven't worked with any of these people and think well you just accidentally became mm. willem dafoe you're like nah man like look at how you conduct yourself look at how you work um and i guess all you can do if you're lucky enough to get opportunities like them is to try and emulate that work ethic and uh yeah how uh, how did it work with that movie was it with did they build sets for all the diving um bits and bobs because like watching that that is a it obviously the story itself is absolutely mental like i and watching the film i didn't realize it with because i don't want to give it away for the audience but didn't realize how they actually got them out oh, and yeah. i i was just like oh my <laughs> god um so it must have been a pretty intense shoot but like in terms of the diving a lot of it was obviously underwater and stuff how did you have training for that was there kind of like a you know did you have to kind of go through various things before you got on set and did that yeah, all of those things, man. Like uh, we we came out of quarantine straight, didn't even go to the hotel, straight to studio. And we had two weeks um, <clears throat> training in the pool uh, where we started off in these big, big tanks. Um, you had a one-on-one -on -one person, my guy, amazing dude called Kenny, um, who sort of teaches you how to do with this. Because scuba diving is very, very different from cave diving. Um, <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Literally, like, the only thing that's similar is the water. Everything else is different. Um, how you do everything is very, very different. Um, so we trained for about two weeks. Um, and actually, we trained pretty much throughout the whole film, even, even right up to the last sort of couple of weeks, we'd, we'd come, come in because they were constantly building new chambers, new sets for us and filling them up with water. We'd walk through them dry first, then they'd fill them up. And we'd often come in on a Saturday or, or the end of the day, they'd say, do you want to 
get up and go through the the new tunnel that you're going to be shooting in next week and and so we do that um yeah we just worked our asses off and, but what was amazing about it was it didn't matter who you were i remember this walking out into the tank the first day and it was me paulie paul gleason who, who plays um jason in the film vigo colin and jolie and we were all in the pool and it didn't matter who you were you were all babies like we were all starting from scratch we were all and that's the beautiful thing i think about um our industry that you could be um fucking meryl streep but if you were going to be in that diving movie you got to start from zero like everyone else <laughs> so you're all learning <clears throat> and it kind of even evens it all out i think because we'd, we'd learn as we go and we'd help each other out and we'd be watching each other underwater and like i'd sort of turn to, to joel and be like oh man that was really you look really good there you're like your your hips were sitting really well in the water <laughs> and he'd be like yeah man your fin technique was really good so it's kind of you become these sort of like this camaraderie and stuff mm. which um is so beautiful because you, you find yourself pinching yourself i'd sit and have a cigarette at the end of the day and go man fuck you're lucky do you know what i mean you go look mm -hmm. at the people who who you're working it's one of the only jobs in it where one of the very few careers i think where you can not only you, you can grow up watching someone and admiring their work and then you are there with them do you know what i mean mm, mm, and mm. you're actually doing it and they're looking you in the eye and you're doing a scene together uh and you'll always have that do you know what i mean you could mm. never work again but you've worked with people that you that you that uh, you look up to and 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 might be the reason you wanted to be an actor um and there you are looking them in the eyes doing it it's it's a, an incredible blessing and uh one that has never lost on me it, it's tricky though isn't it i think sometimes if you work with someone that's so familiar to you you realize you're watching them and then there's obviously a gap where you're supposed to speak and then you're like oh it's me sorry yeah, yeah. I was yeah. <laughs> it's like... my, my best mate he's doing this um he's filming this show at the moment and he said there's this actor in it i, I won't say what the show is but the actor's eddie marsan and i was asking him this morning actually having a cigarette and a cup of coffee and i said uh I said, what's he like? And he was like, man, he's so fucking good. He said, when he came in, he did the scene where he's got this big speech. And he said, just that. He said, I almost forgot to do my, he goes, I forgot to do any acting or, or to react because I was sat there going, fucking hell, he's good, isn't he? Look at, oh, Jesus, he's, oh, fuck, that's me. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, probably even better, though. You probably look like you're doing no acting at all. Like, perfect, yeah. stealing the scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I suppose, you know, one thing I, 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 I sort of have been happy with is I remember thinking before I got the um, before I started to get some wonderful opportunities over the past few years, I remember thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to be so intimidated. Um, I, you know, how would I ever ask Ron for a note or something? Do you know what I mean? I'd be so quaking in my boots. So sort of, yes, I'll just do whatever you want. Um, I wouldn't feel collaborative with him. But what I found so amazing is these people are, it doesn't matter if you're Ron Howard and you've done fucking everything to such a high standard for so long. He's still there caring. And, and I never once felt he hasn't got time for you. He's busy. He's Ron fucking Howard. Never. I could say to him, hey, Ron, I was thinking in this. I remember asking him one day. I remember asking Chris Jewell. I texted him, who's the guy I was playing. And I said, what were you doing in the fucking cave? I said, we've got this scene where we're sitting around. We're going to do nothing. None of us are doing it. And the boys are getting writing some letters to their mom. I said, like, what were you doing? I said, oh man, I remember that. He goes, because I remember looking over. He goes, I was sat trying to open this bottle of water for ages. And because my hands were wet and it was slippery, I couldn't open this water bottle. So I was really thirsty. I was like, amazing. I can just be drinking more. It's such a small little thing. But I remember yeah, coming yeah. on again and be like, do you mind if I? And you don't feel like a dickhead for asking. You don't feel like you're wasting his time. He just says, yeah, great. I love that. You know, is that a, I was like, yeah, Chris told me this thing. And just cares about all these little cogs and mm -hmm. that's something i've been really um very touched by in our industry that, that that i've been very lucky not to have come across any sort of tyrants that are sort of at the head of the game don't disturb the genius sort of thing you know mm -hmm. are you sure there's not one <laughs> <laughs> they are, but you erase those from your memory don't you're like here's the list <laughs> the crazy thing about Ron Howard is, is, is also his range. The fact that, you know, obviously he was an actor, but then he went, he, he directed Splash, didn't he? Splash, he did. was, yeah, Splash. But then you, then you look at like Apollo 13, you look at like the film that you've just done with him and it's like, what? How can you, you be Grinch, good at man. all these? The Grinch. Everyone forgets the Grinch, that. Yeah. People think that's a Tim Burton movie because it's so Tim Burton, like in yeah. its crazy art style, but you go, that's wrong. Yeah. Ron, that's crazy. Willow, He's I just. Over, I so versatile. Yeah, he's just, yeah, he's amazing.
He's amazing. He's one of those people as well. You watch his movie and you don't go, oh, this is a Ron Howard movie in the best possible way because yeah. every single film he does is completely different. Totally different. And you know, uh, he said this beautiful thing. He said, I don't see, he said, I don't see myself as a director. He said, I see myself as um, a researcher who just needs to share what I've learned. So like with the, the 13 Lives movie, he just researched everything you could just devoured it and just mm -hmm. all he he said i just see it my job to tell that to people and similarly with like rush or but he's a real uh, a real master i think like of what he's done like jesus he's just one of the greats he's yeah, up there he's with you know him. spielberg uh, ridley scott and that's just yeah he's one of the greats and i mean obviously we we talked about how you know working and getting these jobs and these incredible people that you work with but um, I think it's always interesting and it's always important to talk about the times when you're out of work and what you do, like what your coping mechanisms are and how you deal with that kind of time off. Do you have like any sort of hobbies or things that you do that kind of keep you sane when you're, you know, waiting for the phone to, to ring? Completely, um, completely I do. And, and, and I had to learn that, um, <laughs> you know, very, very quickly. Uh, I like to give myself something else to do, um, be it and I'd gone off snowboarding or I remember uh, I finished a job and had to wait for a while and, and didn't know when my next one was. So I taught myself scuba diving. That was about six, seven years ago. Um, I just went off and was like, right, I can fly back anytime. Um, I like to stay busy, I think. But then also allowing yourself the downtime. I think it's I think it's very important to go. Do you know what? Take this time, rest, um, exercise, sleep, meditate, be, you know, like get see your friends, see your family because a lot of the time when you're working, you don't get to have a sort of social life and you miss out on it. So I make sure I'm like, see all my friends, see all my family, check in on people, have a fucking life, man, go on a holiday. Mm -hmm. um, even if the holidays just, you know, drive to fucking Cornwall or something, just like get in a tent, just do some, um, just live. Cause I think the hardest thing is sitting by the phone, waiting for it to ring, constantly mm -hmm. refreshing your emails is, you know, is there anything <laughs> to tape for or, or anything like that. Um, and, and a really big thing that I've started doing is, 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 and just in the past few years, and really it was lockdown um, because there was just so much, I'd never had that much time of just nothing. Like there was no, there was nothing to read or, or, or watch or audition for. It was just, mm. yeah. um, <clears throat> you can't really go out and do anything because everyone no, was kind of locked in as well. It was yeah. a bad, bad time. Yeah. So it was a, it was a, I think it was a good sort of training mechanism for what do you do when you're you're you when you have nothing I guess but and I I started writing um a lot and uh I found that was amazing because it it, it gave you you feel creative I think a really hard thing with acting is it's one of the only art forms I think it is probably the only art form that you uh except for maybe singing um that you can't do without anyone else you can't you can't if you're a painter you can paint if you're a musician you can play your instrument if you're a writer you can write if if you know uh, but, but with with an actor you can't do i can't just do some acting um it'd be weird like i think um having a creative outlet is really important it, whether you do something with the writing or not but just i think that's what i found i thought you know what i'm just gonna write i had this idea for this thing i'm just gonna write it because i got no excuse and i remember feeling the, a similar exhausted creative buzz that I would at the end of a day's rehearsing or filming, you know, where you go, I am so tired, but I'm buzzing. I'm happy. I want to talk to people about it, but I've got the energy to, you know, that feeling after mm. a day's rehearsal or something. That's what I felt. And I remember thinking, wow, you can have this feeling for free. Um, you don't need to wait for permission. You don't need to wait. If you've just got a fucking laptop or a pen and a pad of paper, you can just write. Um, and, and and, it, and I think it will inform as well. It makes you sort of. I feel it makes me a better actor because it makes me appreciate the the, the script more because I start to write them. Um, uh, yeah, that's sort of what I've started to do now in my downtime. I think that's interesting as well because you then get to sort of play with dialogue from a different angle, and and can you you kind of realize what works and what doesn't work, and mm. why sometimes a line might feel like a little bit eggy, and you're like. Oh, why does that not feel right okay. and then um, watching as well watching once you start to step up because i think there is a bit you know with actors it's like kind of stay in your lane a little bit but once you start to just look over your shoulder and see what other people are doing and i found on funny woman moana banks the writer was amazing watching her she's fucking her brain is incredible watching her 
sitting by the monitor with a, little, with a script and a pen and just waiting like a fucking like a trap or spider waiting to just go <laughs> and and like fixing problems oh that doesn't work no that's not very good try this try this and she'd come up with like five different things and your appreciation for that for that form of of, of creativity but at the same time um going i can have a go at that because really all writing is is it's is it's, it's learning how to exp- how to communicate your thoughts i guess to another person and that's what acting is you're just communicating someone else's thoughts but it's your interpretation of thoughts i guess so it's similar-ish thing mm-hmm. i think this thing about this and um it's very exciting and i think um it's a little bit like impro it's just letting your creative juices go just let them flow and i think there's nothing scarier than the blank page but at the same time there's nothing more exhilarating because you think well anything can happen you know i could literally make anything happen if i want an explosion or if i want someone to just split in two and now they're two people you know what i mean you can do anything you let your imagination go wild it's a it's a sort of free available blessing for anyone who wants to do it can you imagine yourself because obviously you've worked with kenneth branner and people like that who do obviously write direct produce they do every kind of facet of the industry can you imagine yourself doing you know say you like writing something like that and then actually going off and maybe directing or and doing other facets of the of the industry um yeah i can't yeah i can i don't know if anytime soon i'm very <laughs> scared i think um i i've done a lot of uh, uh, i've been very lucky that a few of my things that i've written are getting made and what's amazing about that is i remember the first time i started writing thinking you i did i would never call myself a writer and I suppose it's this interesting thing at what point, nor would I ever before I was an actor call myself an actor until effectively someone else <laughs> decides, yes, you are an actor. You can start calling yourself one. Yeah. Um, you were on a gap year for like three years. You're like, I'm on my gap year. And <laughs> yeah, then people exactly. were like, what are you doing? What yeah, are you doing? <laughs> yeah, 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 just gap yourself. Yeah, oh, I'm accidentally an actor. But I, <laughs> yeah. like, it's funny that we still wait for permission to define ourselves by what we are. And so, you know, this thing of, Oh, I, you know, I like acting, but I'm, but I'm not an actor. I'd like to be an actor. And then equally, I remember when I started writing things, I'd say, you know, yeah, no, I've written and stuff. I'm not a writer. But then I suppose it's the point where, you know, some, it was one of my producers. She said, no, you are a writer because I'm producing the thing you wrote. So you are a writer now. <laughs> um, and so I think there's a similar sort of thing, I think, with directing. I think it would be very scary, like, holy, holy shit. I don't know where I'd start. But I, I think, um, I think if you're, if you love the industry you're in, um, there's no reason why you can't, because I love watching film and theatre and listening to radio plays and reading books and stuff. And, and if you absorb so much of it, you're like, well, I've got this idea. And you think, well, why not? Um, and that those people, you bring up Ken. Ken is one of the most inspiring people that's ever that come into my life, because he is a man who just where everyone asks why, he, he asks why not. He just gets shit done uh, and take no for an answer. Um, he has an idea and he goes, we're doing this thing. It doesn't matter how mad it is, we're gonna do it. Um, and he doesn't seem to be, I'm sure he is in, in, in his own mind when he's alone at home. I'm sure he does feel imposter syndrome, but he doesn't seem shackled by this thing of, oh no, you can't do that because you're just, you know, you, you don't do that. Um, Man, I talk so much shit. I can't remember what you fucking asked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, that that I mean, someone like I was saying, obviously about going into a different facets of the industry. But Kenneth Branagh is a he's an unusual example of someone that has excelled in all areas. You know, someone that's actually he's tried and succeeded. And you know, mm. with movies like Belfast and things like that, you're just like, how, you, yeah. how can you do all these things so well? It's just. Uh, I mean, it's crazy. And you, you've obviously got to work with him multiple times on stage and in film as well. Um, have you got any, have you got anything, any sort of things lined up with him in the future that you can talk about? Or you, you always got him on the phone, like, is there anything coming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, have I? No, I, well, we were just emailing the other day, which sounds like a stupid name drop <laughs> there, doesn't it? But um, Sorry, no, right, because I dropped the name for you, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I just pick it up and drop it again and go, oh, what this little thing. Uh, no, we're we're no, well, there's nothing. There's nothing definite happening. I would I would work with him um, any any time he asked me to. I'd work with him. Um, I think to be perfectly honest, similarly with a lot of people I've worked with, I think fuck, I'd love to work with you again. Um, <clears throat> but there's nothing nothing with Ken in the pipeline yet because um, they went and killed me. They went and killed the shit out of me, which was you know what? It was a blessing. I shouldn't have been in the second one, Death on the Nile. You know, I'm not in that movie. So when 
when uh, Ken called me up and said, you know, you're going to be in it. Uh, with, with oh, was you, your character wasn't originally in it at all? No, like he's only in Murder on Your Own Express and um, he's, he doesn't come into the Death on the Nile at all. They, they beautifully squished together two characters <clears throat> that are in the book and um, turned him into to Book. Uh, who, and so they said, you know, they wanted to have me back on which was really cool I think they liked the what what boot gave them I think was a was a was a the ability to look at Poirot as a human being with a friend and a sidekick and a confidant sort of thing mm -hmm. so I think they they maybe it's the cynical part of me um thinking oh you know it's good to have that device in it but I loved it it coming back um and doing it all with them again it was so fun and I got to do different things um I mean, what an incredible, I mean, you put those two casts of those two films together, it's just outrageous. Man, man. <laughs> it's absolutely and you, outrageous. You just, I know, and it's, and, and even my mum made the joke. I remember the first, the poster for Murder on the Express. My mum said it was like watching, you know, looking at cinema royalty and then just, who's that silly little potato face <laughs> in the back? <laughs> that's me. Um, that's yeah. the moment where your mum was like, oh, this has worked out. This is, this yeah, this is, is doing what, all right. It's doing all right. She, she, do you know what she said? She said, when I got cast in the, it was the play with Ken. Mm. Um, we did the Winter's Tale and Harlequinade. I was in his season and Judy was, Judy Dench was in it. And and I told my mom, I, I went around to have a roast dinner. So I said, oh, I said, I just got a new job. I said, mom, you'll be happy. It's a stage show. She loves me doing theater. Um, I love doing theater, but <clears throat> she doesn't really give a fuck about films or TV. She just loves it when I'm on stage. And uh, I said, oh, I'm doing these, two plays and I said yeah, with Kenneth Branagh and Judy Dench and my mom <laughs> my mom just goes now that's acting that's real acting I was like <laughs> wow I've been working for six six seven years now and, and now finally so what was all that other validation stuff? validation yeah. in a way you know that was her you know she she's she loves she's sort of you know it's fucking out it's Kenneth Branagh and Judy Dench it's mm -hmm. uh, yeah she's like oh that's proper acting now <laughs> Tom, this has been great. It's really uplifting to kind of, you know, hear all these stories, and especially like just hearing that it's possible to work with these people that you admire. It's, it's, I mean, genuinely, like I think for anyone listening to this that's trying to get into acting or, you know, get into the industry at all, I think it's it's really important to listen to these things. So I really appreciate it, man. Thanks for... Oh, thanks man, for not at all. Thanks for... I love... Um, yeah, I love it. The only thing I love more than what we do is talking about what we do. It's, <laughs> it's just so cool. We're just so lucky. Um, and I think anyone, anyone who gets a, you know, if you're lucky enough to discover that this might be what you want to do, um, like, fuck anyone who says no. And, you know, I remember having this teacher who, who sort of was, you know, at school, she was like, oh, you, you've got really good grades, you know, don't waste it, go off to be an actor. Um, fuck those people, you know, they, you know, fuck them just because it's not their life, it's yours. And, uh, and I just think try, just try, keep trying and keep your head up. Because like you said about 20 minutes ago, you just don't know um, what's coming. You don't know what's around the corner. And that is so scary. But give into it and just mm. surf down the river because uh, around the bend might be something amazing, you know. That's the best thing, isn't it? It can all completely, like John Travolta, you can have you can have suddenly a massive comeback <laughs> and there yeah. could be a whole new career ahead of you. It's, oh, yeah, it's mad. Yeah. Um, so, can I ask one last thing? It's a tradition. Cool. Um, do you have an embarrassing moment on set that you can share? Perhaps a line forgetting moment or corpsing moment or something that was absolutely horrendous, but you got through it. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a my first ever stage job, Much Ado About Nothing. Me, an actor called Adam James, and another actor called Elliot Levy. Elliot Levy, um, who just won the Olivier Award for his work in cabaret, he was amazing. Um, we we laughed so hard that we couldn't. Um, I had the line to cue the stage, the the scene change, which is this massive scene change with these revolving stage and stuff. And I had to say the line, and I literally could not say it because um, I couldn't breathe because I was laughing so much at, at Elliot Levy. Um, but the, I think but that was still kind of joyful because it was a fun sort of show and I think we got away with it. But the one, the, one of the worst things that has happened to me, and I hope he doesn't mind me um, saying this, I don't really know him very well at all. I, say this actually. I, got, I did this tiny part in this Hugo Blick thing called The Honourable Woman with Maggie Gyllenhaal. And I love Hugo Blick's stuff. He did the shadow line. I think he's a fucking genius. And they called up and said, look, it's a tiny little part. <clears throat> I've got about three, four scenes, two of them with Maggie Gyllenhaal, two of them with Stephen Ray. I said, I fucking love Stephen Ray. He is amazing. 
So I said, yes, did my two scenes with Maggie Jean Hall. She was amazing and wonderful and I loved it. And then I had these two scenes with Stephen Ray and I was really nervous because I'm a huge fan of his. And the scene is him, he's bollocking my character for sleeping with Maggie Jean Hall because I'm her bodyguard. And he says, she caught you, uh, I, he, he says so. He has a go at me, and he's all like, he's all like, um, fuck me. What's he saying? Anyway, it's not that important. I say to him, well, forgive me, sir, but that was my job. And he, no, I'm sorry. You can cut all this shit out. <laughs> what he said is, she caught you with your trousers down, beat, literally. And I say, well, forgive me, sir, but that was my job. And we did the rehearsal. And I started going, oh my god. And I think I was like 21 or something, like a tiny little kid. And we're doing the scene, and we're rehearsing it. It's not on camera. We're rehearsing it for the crew. And he says his line, um, she caught you with your trousers down. And then he left this beat. And I went, I thought, oh, he's full on to that bit. So I just came with my line and said, well, forgive me, sir, that was my, that was my job. And he just turned to me and went, you just ruined my favorite part of the scene. <laughs> I went, wait, what? And he just said, I was doing a beat. I said, oh, I'm so sorry, man. I said, I'm really sorry. I thought you, you, you maybe weren't gonna say the word literally. He was like, no, it's called a beat. And he was very funny and sweet about it, but at the tender age of 21, where you're fresh out of drama school and you're a big fan and to have that, I was quaking in my boots and, and fuck me, it was horrible. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. So the experience really lived up to your expectations then. <laughs> it did. That was like, uh, yeah, like I, I know, it's one of those awful things. I know who he is because I'm a massive fan, but if anyone asked me, um, asked him who I am, he'd just be like, oh, that's that guy who ruined my favourite <laughs> I had um, a friend of mine on here uh, called Sam Hazeldean and he was talking about doing a scene with Samuel Jackson and mm. he had a similar thing where big group of people around him, all these people watching the scene and he has like, I think it was like two lines and he's waiting and waiting and Samuel Jackson's monologuing <laughs> and then at the end of the scene, he's got to go up and arrest him and say like two words. He would, he would go up there, completely forget the words. Wow. Yeah. I'm so sorry. And he did it like several times. <laughs> and Samuel Jackson was just thinking, like, Come on. apparently it was just like the most humiliating thing ever. They got it in the end, but apparently man. he was just like, oh. Man, it's awful. Man, it's a it? different kind of oh, pressure. You know what? It's a funny thing, man. Like, it ain't easy what we do. And I, it sounds, I don't know. It's, we're so fucking lucky. And, you know, I'm never even going to say anything near our work. It's hard. But, it's hard, man. Like doing doing it is is really tough. And those moments, like your man doing that, like is terrifying because you sort of like, fuck me. Imagine anyone else in the world going. Not only do you get to meet Samuel Jackson, you're in the scene with him and you're arresting him. What a mind fuck that is for anyone. And he's to about do. to call you a motherfucker, and that's like your yeah. dream. <laughs> <laughs> you go, it's really tough, man. It's like really it, it's hard, and it's like the you know just making best friends with that horrible sinking nervous feeling that we are just never going to get rid of. We're just going to be staring yeah. in the back. It's just a lifetime of that's our companion for life, man. It's those yes. fucking butterflies in your stomach that is never going to go away in this. I remember doing this play. I hadn't done a play in like three, four years. I was doing Coriolanus at um, Sheffield Crucible. And the first preview, I was under the drum, uh, the stage about to go on. And I remember literally I was shaking. I was sweating. I felt sick. I remember thinking, why the fuck am I doing this? Why do I choose to do this for a job? This is so stupid. But then you do the show and you come off and go, that's why I want to do it. Cause there's nothing better than that feeling. But that, that sort of overwhelming sick feeling of I'm just going to run out of the stage door. And <laughs> bus and oh, just, you get that too. Yeah. That's good then. I'm, I'm not Every the only one. <laughs> person, if anyone says they don't get nervous, they're just lying you know as you say it's that it's that once you're eased into it and you've done it a few times and you're a week in or whatever not even a week it's usually like you know once you've just done it once or twice and then you're like something like okay breathe mm -hmm. and then you can enjoy and you can play um but it's getting to that point isn't it and making mm -hmm. sure you don't run <laughs> in the yeah. meantime just, yeah keep your fucking feet glued to the ground and breathe <laughs> Yeah, man. Right, mate. Anyway, thank you so much. Um, thank you for having really me, man. It's really this. cool you're doing this. It's great. So, uh, um, mate, it's something. It was something to keep me sane in um, in lockdown, and now it's it's stuck. So I'm I'm gonna keep doing amazing. it. And and I just yeah, it's great fun chatting to people like you and just you know talking about films. Really, that's pretty much what day, it is. And just, but, oh, amazing, yeah. man. All right, mate. Well, um, have a good yeah. one anyway. And, yeah, you um, too. Thanks for having me. And, um, and, um, may yeah. our paths cross again, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Take care, man. Elliot. See you later, man. Bye. Thank you to our guest, Tom Bateman, 
And thank you to Wolf Castella PR. Six part miniseries Funny Woman, also starring Gemma Arterton, is on Sky now. If you enjoyed this episode, please review and share this podcast. It makes a huge difference. We're also on Patreon, TikTok, Instagram. If you'd like to support us and get more content, thank you. It's a life affair, and you better come back next month to a life affair.